Chapter 4 The Lady Irene Irene glanced over the newest recruits. She couldn't help but remember what it was like her first time to Dragon Mount. She had been scared and nervous as well. Nobody spoke as they passed through the guarded stone archway. Once they were through the gate, Irene lagged behind. She watched Cora and Solston lead the way up the winding stairs to Dragon Mount. Warren turned and glanced down. Are you all right, little sister? he asked. Irene smiled. Yes, I'm just tired, she assured him. Warren gave a sympathetic nod. Me too. It's a lot quieter without Nora around, he sighed. Irene grimaced. Well, she wouldn't wish what happened to Nora on anybody, but she secretly was a bit glad that she was gone. Irene had always been at odds with Nora. That woman was a tyrant, and she made sure everyone knew that she was a proper mage and that she was in charge. If it was at all possible, she was worse than Cora. At least Cora could actually be nice sometimes, but only when you weren't expecting it. What really bothered Irene was the fear that was on everyone's mind. That very same feral bull drake that had attacked Nora and mauled poor golden eyes was still out there. Male dragons were extremely territorial, and the chances of running into it again were very high. Irene couldn't stand the thought of losing Melody. The very thought of losing her dragon made her want to wretch. Well, Irene hated Nora. She pitied her as well. Her only two friends were her dragon and her sword companion. Irene didn't know why Nora liked him so much. He hated flying and was so rude and bullheaded. Now come to think of it, perhaps they were the perfect couple after all. Warren spoke again. How's Melody doing? he asked conversationally. Irene blinked as she regained her focus. She is well, for now, considering everything and being cooped up and all, she assured him. We are lucky to have you as our dragon soother. Irene smiled over toward Warren. And I'm glad for your maps. I would be lost without them. <laughs> Nonsense. The dragons always know how to get back home. It's the infantry and navy that get lost all the time, Warren chuckled and leaned over to whisper. Well, I take that back. Cora has always been a bit directionally impaired. Irene flashed Warren in an impish grin. She knew he was alluding to the little prank when they had swapped out Cora and Nora's maps and compasses. Supposedly, they wound up all the way in the Gojin Marsh, where Nora had found Vila, or rather, Vila had found them. The little trick might have been considered a success if they didn't have to listen to Nora complain about Vila for months straight and then pine away, wondering if he would ever come to her. He did, of course. And Irene didn't know why. The man was a big lummox, and she wasn't jealous, because there wasn't anything to be jealous about. Irene quickly pushed Vila out of her mind, and quickly changed topics. What do you think of our new recruits, she asked. Yes, well, they come and they go, I suppose. 
I don't get too attached to anybody or start mentoring anyone until a year or so, he advised. Irene nodded. It was good advice. Then again, if Cora wasn't so cruel, people might actually want to stick around. Irene shuddered. Some of the recruits had even taken their own lives. But this still wasn't enough to get her to tone things down. If anything, Cora had ramped things up a notch to make up for Nora's absence. While she had enjoyed the chat with Warren, she quickly came to regret that she had lingered so far behind everyone, as now she had no idea who to give the books back to. With their bald heads and great clothes, it was difficult to tell them apart. This, of course, was intentional. It was rare for recruits to be remembered or called out by name. That was unless... Something bad happened, or if they were being singled out for punishment. Nora took in a calming breath and channeled her inner Nora rage monster. With a graceful and calm, determined poise, she strode into the dormitories. At once, the recruits who weren't working quickly got busy. While she didn't exactly know any of their names... She could tell by their body language and how personalized their cramped little rooms were that they had been around for a while. Irene couldn't help but feel a bit awkward about ordering young men and women about that at times were older than she was. It didn't help that she was short. Well, not that short. Everyone was short when standing next to Nora or Simmons. Simmons was so tall, she actually felt a little bad for him. Magi Solston gave Irene a concerned look. I was beginning to worry about you. Are you doing all right? he asked. I'm fine. I'm just uh, doing some inspections, she announced and gave the recruits a stern glare. How long do you think you can pretend to clean that same blasted doorknob? she demanded. The recruit gulped and quickly scurried off. Cora smiled and gave Irene a nod of approval. You're getting the hang of it, she praised her. Irene forced herself to match the old hag's devious tight-lipped grin. It's a rather satisfying, isn't it, she remarked. If it was at all possible... Cora's grin got bigger, and her eyes sparkled all the more fiercely. Would you like me to help, she asked. Irene pursed her lips thoughtfully. How about I start at the top and get some practice first, and you can start at the bottom, and then we'll meet in the middle, she suggested. That sounds like an excellent idea. It will give the rest of the cockroaches less time to coordinate and hide contraband. Cora concurred. Irene forced herself to smile. She hated being cruel, but she knew why it had to be. Dragon Hall was not for civilians. Thankfully, dragons only needed to eat once a month, but it didn't stop their prey drive. This could be somewhat controlled, through a soul bond, but not always. The soul bond merely allowed the dragon master to compel a dragon to return and to be aware what the dragon was thinking and feeling at the moment. However, that moment could quickly change in the blink of an eye. Staying focused, Irene proceeded on her way. The new recruits had just received their blankets and bedding. The only problem was, Irene just couldn't tell who was who. Books were expensive, and she couldn't get caught asking a line of recruits to describe their books to her. With calm, poised determination, she passed by each room. At the end of the hall, she found what she was looking for. The bald-headed recruit sat glumly by herself on the edge of her little cot, I see you have a room to alter yourself, Irene remarked. 
The recruit did not raise her head. She seemed a little disappointed. Irene quickly recognized Magi Solston's book on the nightstand, and as discreetly as she could, she walked over and slid her fingers along the, the writing desk at the center of the room. You'll get used to it. Recruits come and go, Irene assured her. May shook her head. It's not that. I forgot my books. The Magi Cora said, If I left to get them, I wouldn't ever be allowed back into Dragon Hall again, she sniffed. Keeping the books hidden, Irene turned and glanced down at the bald-headed young woman in surprise. How did you know Cora was a mage, Irene asked. May glanced up wordly. Well, she was in Master Warren's book, but I forgot it, she explained. Irene quirked a curious brow. Am I in his book as well, she asked curiously. Yes, Master Irene, she replied meekly. He spoke very highly of you and said you were very nice, but you like keeping to yourself and your dragon. Irene fought the urge to turn around and begin gleaning through the book for her name. And uh, what did he say about Nora? She pried curiously. The young girl's sapphire blue eyes went big with panic. I haven't read it all, she said quickly. Good answer, Irene responded coldly. She glided her finger across the desk and let out a scathing tisk. Oh, your room is filthy. If I find this again, you'll be have five lashings. Do you understand? She snapped at her. Do you understand? Irene repeated louder this time. But she was completely taken off guard as the bald-headed recruit leapt off the bed and embraced her with a big, warm hug. Irene flannered about. She wasn't sure what to do. This was not supposed to happen. She could feel the genuine gratitude and warmth radiating from the girl. Irene quickly shoved May's hands down and forced her to stand at a distance and reprimand the starry-eyed recruit. Don't ever do that again! If anybody asks, you found those books in your pack. This is not a fun camp or a dragon petting zoo, and I am not your friend, Irene insisted sternly. May beamed up at her and quickly nodded her head. Irene quickly dusted off her tunic and braced her hands on her hips and gave May another stern glare. I meant what I said about the lashings, Irene warned. May bowed her head. I know, Cora told me that too, she sighed and bit her lip. Is she really that mean, she asked wordly. Worse, especially now. Irene warned. But, but why? She gasped in shock. Irene sighed. The first thing you need to know about Cora is she doesn't like anybody, and she is especially cruel to the people that she does like, she warned. That must be really hard for you, May whispered. Irene hesitated. Again, the recruit had taken her off guard. What else is in that silly book, she demanded. Nothing, May said quickly. Irene grimaced and glanced around. Do you have any other questions before I go, she asked. What did your parents think about you becoming a dragon rider, May asked hesitantly. I didn't ask, so I don't know, she shrugged. May bit her lower lip. May I ask another question, Master Irene, she ventured. Irene gave a nod. Could I see Melody? No! You just got here! Don't get any ideas of trying to sneak in there. If I took you in, you'd be torn limb from limb. And you wouldn't be the first L Molly to do so, she snapped at her. May lowered her head. She wasn't sure who Molly was, but she was scared to ask. Instead, she fished out a tangerine-sized blue glass b ball from her pocket and handed the dragon charm over to Irene. I heard she likes the color blue. Irene hesitated. Yes, she does fancy blue, she agreed, and her eyes narrowed 
into suspicious sideways slits. Do you have any more? Or do I have to call Cora in and shake you up and down? Irene asked coldly. May gulped and quickly handed over the hidden pouches under her baggy gray shirt. And each pouch was a dragon charm. These weren't magic, but dragons liked shiny objects. And they saw a glass ball just as valuable as any gem. And since they only needed to feed once a month, they often found treasure far more appealing than even food. Irene wasn't sure whether to be angry or impressed. You carried all of those up here? Where did you get this? she demanded. I made the belt and pouches and bought the charms, May mumbled. Irene grimaced. Your new name is Trouble. May bit her lower lip wordily. I didn't know I wasn't allowed to bring them. Nobody said I couldn't, she began. You didn't ask either, Irene snapped, but then closed her eyes. She remembered what she had said only moments ago. May dropped her gaze. Please don't send me away, she begged. Irene grit her teeth as she wagged her finger, but she was at a loss for words. Finally, she gave up and placed a stern hand on May's shoulder and gazed deep into her big, frightened blue eyes and spoke in a low, stern voice. Stay away from the stables and don't get yourself killed or do anything stupid and you might actually live to be a dragon rider one day, she advised and pivoted back around and stormed out of the dormitories. But on her way through the dining hall, she spotted Torn. Master Torn was a big black mountain of silence. He sat at the table alone with a big mug of hard drink in his mangled hands. Torn was not a mage or an artist. He was a battle-scarred veteran, and through pure grit and determination, he had gotten into Dragon Hall the hard way. Irene frowned as he glanced down at the sword on his belt and the large crossbow next to him. Well, it was not uncommon for Torn to carry a sword everywhere he went. Well, he probably even slept with it. It was a bit overboard to go roaming around a mountain fortress with a loaded crossbow in the dining hall. Still, the more anybody had tried to convince him that it wasn't necessary, the more tightly he clung to it. Irene slowed down. The tension in the air was so thick she could cut it with a knife and scrape it on toast. He was scared. Everybody was scared, and everyone was handling it badly. Irene couldn't help but wonder what things would be like if old man Don Ruskell was around. She wondered what he would do. Irene bit her lip and quietly sat down across from Torin. She made up her mind that she wouldn't scold him like Magi Cora or try to reason with him like Magi Solston. Instead, she would be his friend. Is there anything I can do to help? Irene inquired. Torin slid his heavy wooden mug across the table. Irene felt her face go red with anger and embarrassment. He didn't even smile or make eye contact with her. He just held up his empty mug like she was some kind of tavern maid. I was trying to be nice. Nora snapped at him and slammed the door behind her. Once she was in her private quarters, Irene tossed the dragon charms onto her large canopy green bed and glanced out the small stone circular window frame. Her face was flushed red with tears. She felt so trapped and alone. She couldn't talk to the recruits, and her peers looked down at her. Warren at least was pleasant, but he still saw her as a child. Irene wiped her tears and went over to light a stick of incense and closed her eyes. 
Sprigga, guide me, she pleaded. Sprigga was the goddess of spring, wisdom, and new beginnings. Over as much as she tried to meditate on the holy scriptures, her mind kept drifting back toward Torn. She remembered yelling at him. That had not been right. She had only been nice for selfish reasons. She hadn't been nice at all. In fact, she hadn't been downright horrible. Taking a deep breath, Nora grit her teeth and turned back around. She was going to make things right, and she wasn't going to turn into a bitter, shriveled-up old prude like Cora. However, the dining hall was empty. Irene sighed. She already knew where Torrin was. On the very top peak of Dragon Mount was the watchtower. In that little, cold, cramped room was a small shrine dedicated to to Master Don Rascal. While the shrine was dedicated to their beloved dead mentor, it was Torrin who haunted that tower. This was Torrin's place of solitude and contemplation. Irene had tried to come visit him several times before. He never spoke to her. His silence was so deafening and oppressive, Irene couldn't even bear to stay in the same room with him for more than a few minutes. Even if she was playing her harp, Torn's gloomy silence drowned her out. But that wouldn't happen today. As she approached the base of the ladder, Irene smiled, imagining the look on his face when she came up through the hatch with a plate full of cookies and a mug of hard drink. A big black boot pressed firmly down on the hatch. Who goes there? Torrin growled. Irene gasped in frustration. It's me! Password! Torrin demanded. Irene rolled her eyes. I brought hard drink and cookies, she announced. And the boots slid off the wooden hatch. But when Irene poked her head out, she was not greeted with torn, smiley face. Instead, she stared up at the bent arms of his loaded crossbow. Torn glanced behind her suspiciously. Without a hint of remorse or apology for scaring her, Torn turned and picked up his spyglass and found something interesting to look at. You could have shot me, Irene protested. Torn lowered his spyglass and frowned, a deep frown, and gave her the look. That look was sufficient for all occasions and answered all of life's possible questions with no, now go away. Irene wanted to throw something at him, but she reminded herself why she had come in the first place. I'm sorry I yelled at you in the dining hall. She apologized and held up the large mug of hard drink to him. Torrin said nothing and turned back towards his spyglass. Irene sighed and quietly set the mug down on the wooden stool beside him and returned with a plate full of cookies with bright frosted smiles. I brought you cookies as well, she declared, as she pushed the tray into his arms. Haunted, dark, mahogany brown eyes glanced down at the happy faces. Torrin offered them back. I made them all for you. Oh. Her voice trailed off as Torrin took the plate and dumped all of the cookies out the window. Irene's mouth dropped open and she stared up at the large, thankless beast before her. Oh, oh, why did you do that? She gasped. I don't like cookies, Torn grunted and handed her back the empty plate. Irene quietly turned away, hiding her face so that he would not see her quivering bottom lip. And when she realized that the thank you or apology would not come. She climbed back down the ladder 
and walked over to the nearby window to regain her composure. She flinched as the metal plate bounced off the windowsill. Irene swallowed hard as she watched the plate continue its flight down the steep granite cliff face and then went on her way. Everyone had their secret place. Torn's was the lookout tower, but Irene had one even better. It had been years since she had been there last. Normally she could just take Melody and fly away and be by herself, but right now was different. She had found this secret place when she was a recruit. It had been the only place she could go to be alone, the only place nobody would find her or scream or be upset with her. When no one was looking, Irene slung her travel harp over her shoulder. When nobody was looking, Irene slung her travel harp over her shoulder and quietly deviated from the path. She flattened herself up against the rough, uncut, natural granite mountain wall, began inching her way around the narrow shelf. One misstep and she would plummet hundreds of feet to her death. However, Irene was a dragon rider. She was no stranger to heights, and she had looked death in the face every day. Once she was around the bend, she smiled as she came to a comfortable, spacious little nook. The smooth, moss-covered sitting rock called to her. She knew this place by heart. Every rock, every stone, like the back of her hand. It was exactly the way Irene paused, and she frowned when she spotted the little wood shavings at her feet. Somebody else had been here. Irene didn't know why, but she felt angry and violated. She turned and quickly spotted the loose rocks and pulled them away. Inside the stone seam, she discovered a wooden box. She pulled it out. She hoped she would find contraband of some kind, so she could find an excuse to be rid of the trespassers. But what she found were drawings. Beautiful, breathtaking drawings of birds, and of Glendon City, and of the little flowers that grew in the cracks of rocks, and of course, dragons. So many dragons. Irene bit her lip as she closed the little wooden box shut. Whoever had come here came often, and she could tell by the sooty fingerprints whoever it was most likely worked in the fire pits nearby. That meant they would be back soon. It was what she would have done, after all, when she was a recruit. With a poised, secret smile, Irene put the rocks over the, the stone seam and quietly climbed up a little further until she found a nice little perch where she could observe from a distance without being seen. Time passed, but Irene was patient. From where she sat, she had the perfect view of the bright green ocean right in front of her. Over to the east, she could see the sun shining down on the bright orange shingled rooftops. The local deep red clay was so abundant and plentiful. At first glance, it seemed like everyone in Glendon had the same gentle sloping bright orange tile roof. Over a variety of soft, creamy beige pastel brick structures, there were a few exceptions, of course. A few of the large mansions of wealthy merchants and government officials had chosen copper plating instead, which had now aged into a lime green patina in the sun. Irene turned away and fixed her gaze onto the horizon. Her long, braided, thick black hair rested over her shoulder. She had found this little secret place many years ago when she was a recruit, so she could sneak away to practice her music. Unlike many of the recruits, she had been chosen to become a dragon master rather quickly 
making her the youngest of six dragon masters remaining in Dragon Hall. There had been eight, but after the two recent tragedies, with their senior and most experienced dragon master being found dead, and Nora Frey being exiled, there were only six left. While Irene was the youngest of the Glendon Dragon Riders, she was perhaps the most famous. She had called in a young speckled gray feral fledgling at this very spot. Melody was its name. Melody was a very beautiful, very curious, and very bright dragon, and after a few treats, quickly became quite friendly and very protective. Unwilling to be trained or answer to anyone else, Irene was quickly promoted after serving less than a year as a recruit. Many years later, her story had become a bit of a legend, and Irene was affectionately known as the Dragon Whisperer, or Dragon Soother. Most dragons liked music, but Melody loved music, and would fall asleep right in her lap. At least that was when she was small. Now, Melody was too big for that. Unfortunately, after the recent tragedies, Irene had not been able to take Melody out flying. She missed going out alone and playing her harp inside the secluded deep blue chambers hidden away in the mountain glaciers. As much as she wanted to be with Melody now, Irene did not want her dragon to catch on to the sense of dread and fear that gnawed at her insides. Instead, she focused on the ocean and took in a deep breath and exhaled, letting go of the nightmares, the nightmare of losing Melody, losing Melody like Nora had lost golden eyes to the giant bull drake that circled overhead. Constantly looking for a way to get at their colony. Everyone was torn about how to handle the bull drake. Magi Cora, Simmons, and Master Torrin were eager to kill it. But Master Warren and Magi Solston were convinced there was another way. They just needed time to think of something. But time was running out. As much as Irene was frightened for her melody, she could not bring herself to kill the great bull drake. She wanted a chance to at least try to call it in, to try and tame it. Killing the bull drake would be absolutely meaningless. Cora, who had been close friends with Nora Frey, was out for revenge, and every problem to Torn was an ugly nail sticking out of a board that either needed to be smashed or ripped out. Simmons was afraid. Afraid like everyone else. Irene was afraid too, but she couldn't see the benefit of killing such a beautiful creature. She hadn't come to Dragon Hall to kill dragons. Neither had Simmons. Simmons just believed that killing this one would save the others from being harmed, but Irene felt differently. Killing this one would only mean they would be precisely where they were. But if she could call it in and tame it, they would actually be making progress. But the feral bulldrake was massive, and no one had ever called one in that big or old before. Well, at least not tamed it after. But no recruit had ever called a, and tamed a young feral fledgling with a harp before either. At least not in Glendon, and certainly not in living memory. There were stories, but that was all. There were stories of rainbows and pots of gold waiting on the other side as well. Those stories were not true. She and Melody had checked many times. Irene let out a long pent-up breath, but just as she felt the tension of her harp strings. But she winced when she heard the horrid twang, but it was not from her harp. 
It was from the rocky outcropping below. Without moving, her jade green eyes peered downward. It was a recruit. A large youth with a sturdy frame and smiling boyish face. Irene was about to scold him for being lazy and sneaking off when she saw him pull out a simple hand-carved wooden lyre from the nook that she had not yet discovered. Irene's story of calling a feral fledgling out of the clear blue sky and being chosen within the year was one and a billion. There had been some recruits by chance who had found eggs or a hatchling in an abandoned nest while out mountain climbing, but there were many more stories of recruits falling and or being thrown off the ledge by angry mother dragons and or hatchlings growing too large and eating them later. Regardless, recruits still tried. Irene could not fault anyone for trying as much as she wanted to yell at the young recruit, she felt a smile crease her lips as he began to tune the strings of his instrument. Irene plucked a chord, and the soothing rich note sang out, causing the young recruit to gasp in dismay as he turned to look up at her. Master Irene, I was, I was, um, I, I, he began. Your lyre is out of tune. Irene remarked coldly. He nodded. Irene extended her hand, and he reluctantly gave it up to her. What's your name, recruit? she inquired. My name is Brumir, he confessed, clearly worried whether she was going to return his instrument and dreading as to what sort of punishment he would receive for skipping out on his duties. If Nora had caught him, she would have smashed the liar on the rocks, right in front of him, and told him to get back to work. That's if she was feeling charitable. Irene had seen her recruits flogged for taking a few biscuits from Chow Hall instead. Irene fished out the middle tuning fork from her tunic and struck it. The twin prongs hummed as they were placed upon the wooden uh, sound box until finally, with careful and precise adjustments, the layer strings melted together into an enchanted stream of rich, colorful tones. Brumir gulped as he accepted the, the layer back. It wasn't tuned the way he would have done it, but... The chords melted together so wonderfully that he wouldn't have wanted them to be any other way ever again. Do you often come here to shirk your duties? Irene inquired. Brumer grimaced. I wasn't shirking ex exactly. I was um just letting the fire settle down for a bit and getting some fresh air, he explained. I see. Is that your wooden box? And the rocks as well, Irene inquired. Brumer's eyes went big, but he quickly shook his head. I, I don't know whose those belong to. Irene's stern frown deepened. I think you do. Somebody has been drawing up here while they should have been working. And I want to know who it is right now, she insisted coldly. Brumer's voice face hardened. I will take my lashings, but I won't rat out my friends, he insisted stubbornly. Irene quirked a brow. She wasn't entirely sure what to do next. Everyone else would have been blubbering and telling her whatever she wanted to hear. At least, if she were Nora, they would. Maybe she was too soft. Are you going to play or not, she demanded and glanced down at the wooden box, and then at the harp in his hands. Simple, yet wonderful care and craftsmanship. Whoever had done so had carved them both, but had he drawn those pictures? She couldn't be sure. 
Boomer grinned as I gently felt the stringers hum beneath his fingers. I uh, should probably be getting back to work, he remarked and then paused. Will you be here again? he asked curiously. Irene did not respond, but the subtle, soft, secret smile on her lips told him all he needed to know before he darted off. Hello, I'm the author of Founder's Keep. I'm currently a independent writer. And that means I don't have a, you know, a team working for me. Uh, as it, I don't, you know, I don't, I'm not with the big box guys. I don't even know where to submit my manuscript, what, or if they will even accept it. Because, you know, I don't have a name. I don't have a reputation. So I'm going directly to the audience. And by virtue of democracy, if you like what I'm doing and you want to, you know, want to hear more, and this is a 400-page manuscript, and there will be more. Uh, so, uh, if you want to hear that, uh, follow the channel uh, by by subscribing. It's uh, free to subscribe. It doesn't cost you anything. Uh, it just lets you know when I post, when I when I upload another, uh, an, you know, another chapter, and it really supports me. Uh, not. Uh, not financially, but emotionally. And writing is such a lonely process. And it's so nice to share. And so nice to see that people have enjoyed it. And that's what, that means more to, to me than anything in the world. And, um, and maybe if uh, by virtue of, you know, just... Just, just with the massive audience that you know, one day maybe in in, in the distant future, uh, if that happens, maybe I won't be a lone glee man anymore. Maybe I will get a book deal. And thank you so much for um, for your positive comments and uh subscriptions and uh, you know you know likes cuz that 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 means so much it means so much you have no idea anyways uh hope you have a merry christmas a happy hanukkah a happy new years or just a better day and i hope i made your day a little bit better